Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar as part of our 2021 Analytical Extravaganza. I'm Trey Henry, Sales Engineer at Shimadzu Scientific Instruments. I'll be your moderator today. We will hear from Dr. Ronald Quinlan, and our topic is Brewing Up Laboratory Skills. Before we start, I wanted to share a couple of notes for our viewers. The webinar console has a variety of items to help enhance your experience and interaction with us. In the screen, you will see the following items. The slides will appear on the left-hand side. Directly under the slides, you will see a resource list with clickable links relevant to the material being presented today. On the top middle is the widget for questions and answers. Please submit your questions during the presentation through this widget, and we will answer them during the Q&A session. Just below the Q&A box are the moderator and speaker bios. You may expand the items here to learn more about us. On the right are survey questions that you may fill out anytime during or after the presentation. Finally, at the bottom pane are the icons to bring up all these widgets in case they are minimized or hidden. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Trey Henry, your moderator. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Ronald Quinlan, and our topic is Brewing Up Laboratory Skills. Professor Quinlan received his PhD from the Department of Applied Science at the College of William & Mary in 2008, where his thesis focused on functionalization and characterization of vertical graphene for advanced applications. Professor Quinlan served at a, as a research scientist for the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Carterock, until 2014, when he joined the Department of Molecular Biology and Chemistry at Christopher Newport University as a visiting assistant professor. Professor Quinlan became an assistant professor in 2016 and has been teaching analytical chemistry and instrumental analysis since that time. Professor Quinlan's research interests are ever-expanding but include thin film materials and an analytical approach to sustainable chemistry. Now, I'll hand it over to Dr. Quinlan. Uh, thank you, Trey, for that introduction. Um, and thank you also for the opportunity to share um, a little story about our work, uh, how we got here, um, what we're doing. Um, today, I'm going to share how we are using beer, uh, we're studying beer chemistry to really engage and develop uh, the next generation of scientists and, and hopefully um, better scientists. And there are a couple of different facets to the story. And so first is obviously our interest in food science and what we can learn not only about um, better beer and beer quality, um, quality control measurements, but also other natural compounds and the complex processes that uh, go along with that. And, and perhaps something that um, really hasn't been thought about before. Um, and then the second is, you know, at Christopher Newport, uh, we really care about our students. Um, and we really want to focus on how our students uh, get involved with the research and specifically the beer research um, and what we're doing with that. Um, and like I said, that ties back into, again, developing um, better scientists. Currently, beer is the third most consumed beverage in the world behind water and tea. And while that's true, humans have been brewing beer for thousands of years. Uh, there's even some scientific debate, and by that we mean healthy debate, about whether or not agriculture started because of the desire to purposely brew beer. Um, so as you can see from our notes here, uh, the earliest recipe or, or one of the earliest written records is uh, Samaria uh, between four and 5,000 B.C. Can, you know, Egypt has some proof from 3,000 B.C., India and China both at 2,000 B.C., um, recently, there's even been uh, some reports or, or records um, in China that they found some beer residue on pottery that suggested it might have even been around um, even earlier than, than the 2000 BC. Um, it's generally accepted that the Sumerian poem, the hymn to Ninkasi, shown here on the right, is the oldest written record of a beer recipe. And so you know, all of this goes to show that beer has been a large part of our human civilization. It may have started it even, uh, because if it's accepted that agriculture started the human civilization, and if brewing beer started agriculture, um, it's pretty important to, to our civilization and also to our culture. It's, it's been there for a long time. 
And as a side note to this, uh, the written record, records and, and recipes and things like that, uh, one of the 282 laws found in the Code of Hammurabi uh, deals with the distribution of beer. So that also makes beer one of the longest regulated and oldest uh, beverages, uh, regulated beverages as well. So what does modern brewing look like? Uh, really, you've got uh, three basic ingredients, water, malted barley, and hops, and they get transformed by yeast. Um, and over here on the, the left, you can see uh, a diagram by Ashland Brewing Company or mural or flow chart, um, inf infographic, however you want to describe it, um, that steps through the process. Uh, but initially, you take uh, the malt, it's milled, um, that grinds it up. You're now um, allowing for the extraction of fermentable sugars. This makes your grist, which is then mixed with heated water. That starts forming your mash. Uh, your mash conversion, uh, you're, you're using the natural enzymes to break down some starch and the sugars. Um, then you separate the liquid from the husk, and that forms the wort. And so the wort, if you can see, I'm not used to not having a, a laser pointer here, um, but you can see that the wort is really over on the right side of the infographic, uh, the hot water, the really hot water, and that's where we start the, into the kettle and the controlled boil. And that's where we're going to add our hops. And... Uh, this is the starts the extraction of the alpha and beta acids, the essential oils, the et cetera, um, the aroma, and that's really what we're concerned about with with our work here, specifically initially. Um, and then you get some final separation of your mar malt and wort particles uh, before fermentation. Uh, then we add the yeast, and this is what's called a, a green beer. Um, and then you need to mature it for flavor, and then it's filtered and carbonated and transferred into the bright tank. Um, and then the cellaring process takes place, and that can be anywhere from three to four weeks. Um, and then you have packaging. And throughout all this process, um, oxidation is bad, and specifically um, in the packaging process as well. So we like to clear out. Uh, we use some more forced carbonation um, to get rid of the oxygen in there and uh, prepare our samples. So let's really start to focus in on the hop. Um, on the right, you have a picture of a hop cone. Um, we'll, we'll break that down in a little bit, but you notice the yellow um, area here, the lupulin glands, they contain the resins and the essential oils that we're going to be talking about. But if you recall, the original recipes didn't contain hops. They weren't used originally in beer. Um, it wasn't until around 23 to 79 AD when they were written about by Pliny the Elder. And then the first uh, written record of using hops with beer was around 822 by the abbot Aldohardus in his rules for governing the monastery. And then around the 12th century, the abbot Hildegard of Bingen actually prescribed beer to, to patients because she said that it strengthened the patients. Um, and throughout her time, she wrote over nine volumes of science, and she actually describes hops as a preservative. There's also a quote that's attributed to Henry VIII that hops were a wicked and pernicious weed. Now, that probably depends on your preference for sweet versus bitter or possibly how many pints um, are part of the discussion. But either way, it's fun. It's fun to talk about, and it draws attention to how important hops are. And actually now, hops have replaced Groot as the primary flavoring agent um, for beer. And that's, that's a, a bitter taste. Uh, the, the hops provide the bitter taste that many of us like. Um, if it's sweet, probably talking about the malt. Um, and, but that's a different discussion, and we'll get to that a little later. But now our, our hot plants are also dioecious, which means that they have both male and female versions. And so if we go to a hot farm, what we are probably seeing are the female versions because they produce more of these oils, these essential resins and oils that we want. Um, and like I said, those, those resins and oils come from the lupulin glands, and the commercial plants actually can produce as much as 20 to 30% of the mass of the flower um, in these resins and essential oils. And we typically grow our hops in temperate climates. Um, but if you if you're happen to be at the hop farm or a different climate and, and you're looking and you see the male and the female versions, it's a good chance that what you're doing is actually doing some crossbreeding for some more variety or specific flavor, but there's more on that later as well. From the oil, the resin can be divided into hard resin, soft resin, and essential oils. The soft resins are soluble in hexane and contain our alpha and beta acids that we're going to focus on a little bit later. 
The hard resins are soluble in ether and contain oxidized alpha and beta acids, along with other compounds like xanthohumanol, which is a chalcone. Now, xanthohumanol has some medicinal value in geoblastoma cells and has even been shown to function as an antiviral. So our primary alpha acids are humulone, cohumulone, and adjumulone. And as said, they are found in the soft resin, and they are used as our primary bittering agent. And I, I apologize. I see I've accidentally um, covered up my reference for figure one. It's uh, figure one from Jaskula et al., which is the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, 2008. Um, and I can make the references available upon request, obviously. Um, but this is a figure of the isomerization of our um, alpha acids. And so what happens is during the wart, the acids are isomerized to our isoalpha acids. And the longer they're in the wart and the temperature dependence, um, the more bitterness which is created. And so that's why our alpha acids are the primary bittering agent. And the process is both time and temperature dependent. So because of that, um, brewers have some mechanisms to, to change the profiles um, that they wish. Now, you can also isomerize your alpha acids before adding them to the, to the wort. And you can actually do that post-wort um, boil or what's called dry hopping. And that will give you a different ratio um, of bitterness, also flavors and different aromas. Now, our beta acids are also found in the soft resins. Um, but unlike our alpha acids, they don't isomerize. They oxidize. And so the oxidation products of both the acid, um, alpha and beta acids can actually be found in the hard resins as well. And our beta acids are thought not to contribute as much to the bitter flavor. So they really haven't been studied as much. Now, on the left, we have an oxidation pathway from the beta acids. And it's a um, very similar pathway that's the formation of the hydroxyalo isohumulones from the isoalpha acids, so an oxidation product. Um, we need a better understanding of these complex reactions that take place. Um, the paper shown here, um, it's a great place to start, and they, they use representative and model boils. Um, but this also cleans up some of the reactions that we're trying to study. Um, doing this, however, back to the, the bittering agent for the beta acids, um, they're actually found to be more bitter um, and stronger than alpha acids, but that's not necessarily in a good way. And then from our hard resin compounds, um, you can see the hydroxyalohumulones. Uh, those are our oxidation products from our alpha and beta acids. Um, we also get uh, the compounds like xanthohumanol, which is a phenolic compound. Um, now, xanthohumanol, I, I mentioned it a little bit before, but it's also being investigated um, for use in hormone replacement therapies um, and any type of, uh, or some other medicinal values. Um, a few of the reports indicate that these compounds are actually isomerized in the boil um, as well, and that these isomerized products don't really appear to have any uh, potential health benefit. But then there have been some even more recent uh, studies and efforts that suggest that the microbiota in our intestine may actually convert these compounds back during digestion, um, and so hopefully what you're starting to think here is about a medicinal beer. So on the left here, we have some of the compounds, uh, structures of, of the compounds, and it's from the same paper. Um, and these compounds are actually thought to be responsible for foam stability in our beer. And again, these are formed from oxidation pathways, but we said previously that oxidation is bad. Um, but at the same time, it's a good thing, um, and we just want to draw some attention to the fact that there are a lot of complex reactions that are taking pro uh, place during our brewing process. So hopefully we've highlighted that there's a lot of complexity that's taking place during the brewing process, um, specifically during the, the boil, um, and there's a lot left to discover. But we need to understand our starting materials first. And so our early efforts have allowed us to use um, or excuse me, to identify some basic acids that you can see on the left. But you can also see that there's a lot of unidentified peaks here as well. So, and then when we start comparing our data to the prior literature, that also gets difficult. And one of the big reasons is that uh, we now have better instrumentation. So this includes our pumps, our columns, our tubing, everything, even when we're trying to compare LC data to LC data. Um, so you can see there's a lot of analytical left, um, excuse me, analytical work left. Uh, calibrations, internal standards, standard edition experiments, 
um, things like that to make sure that we get the data correct. We're also seeing some differences based on where we buy our hops. So we're expecting to see different ratios uh, based on the cultivar. So a Cascade versus a, an Amarillo um, hop. But we're observing differences based on region as well. And now we might expect some of this, right? The Yakima Valley in Washington State versus the shores of Lake Constance in Germany. But as more and more craft breweries start to grow their own, uh, their own hops, this creates some more interesting profiles, um, especially when we start talking about things like hydroponics or vertical farming. So we started with the three main ingredients being hops, water, and the malt. Um, and we're really just starting to scratch the surface of all the reactions and the starting materials that we need to characterize. And for each of these main areas, there are many factors and variables that we need to consider. Uh, just a few of the points have been highlighted here. But before we get uh, too far ahead and digging into our approach and, and our data, I really need to give you some background about Christopher Newport University and our students. So here's a picture of Forbes Hall, which houses uh, my department, the Department of Molecular Biology and Chemistry. Um, we are a primarily undergraduate university, or PUI. So you can see we have about 5,000 students. Um, we represent uh, a pretty diverse range of states, countries. Um, you can see our students are ranked among the happiest in the nation. Um, we offer ACS certified degrees in both biochemistry and chemistry. Um, our department uh, has majors that include cell molecular biology, um, chemistry, biochemistry, obviously, and kinesiology. Uh, we share the neuroscience uh, major with the psych department, and we're all housed here in, in Forbes. So I would say one of the hallmarks of our department and our university is actually um, is the student engagement and the student experience. And so here we've got um, our Alpha Chi Sigma, a professional chemistry fraternity celebrating Pi Day. Um, and you can see Captain Chris came out uh, to celebrate with us. Um, and what you, these are members of the fraternity. Uh, you were paid a dollar or a couple of dollars um, in order to support the chemistry club um, and its activities. And uh, these are all volunteers, so no one was pied unwillingly. Um, and so you, you pay a couple of dollars, and then you're able to uh, to pie your friend with a shaving cream pie. There's a video surfacing uh, somewhere online uh, where the fraternity brothers actually pied uh, myself uh, with with a still frozen chocolate pie. Um, I have not forgotten Lucas. Lucas is in this picture as well. Um, you can see he's on the left, uh, but I have not forgotten that. So at CNU, um, as part of that engagement and that experience, uh, teaching is a major focus. And so our students actually get their hands dirty. They're touching the instruments. They're operating them. Um, these are images from um, our senior level chemistry 445 instrumental analysis class. Um, we walk through the mechanisms. We don't want it to just be a box that they put a sample in. Um, we really want to uh, enhance that experience. So you're starting to wonder where the beer, uh, beer came in, and um, it was actually an effort to grow student engagement in the classroom, specifically in analytical chemistry. And so a lot of my students had a, a very diverse background um, as far as their preparation for the course and a desire to continue in the field. Um, a lot of them are finishing a minor, some are majoring in chemistry, some students have had organic, some haven't. Um, so I was looking for a way really to engage all students. And beer just seemed like a logical format. Uh, so I joined the American Society for Brewing Chemists. Uh, we started printing off methods. And I was really trying to focus on students um, developing their logical thinking um, and adapting to different things in an industry environment and showing them that there are, there are other careers in industry out there. Um, so these, uh, this is the syllabus uh, for this year, actually. And so uh, we are using some instruments, but we're, we're focusing on wet chemistry as well. We're focusing on titrations, um, internal standards, standard edition methods, um, and things. What I wanted them to do was to envision that as they come into lab, they are they're coming into work. And so a place where they can experiment, they can grow, they can learn, um, and actually relate it to something in their life. So in order to do that, 
um, I needed some help, which introduces the brew terms. So on the left, we have Emily Carancho, um, and on the right, Samantha Hillen and Ashley Hiltebrand. Um, they're really the first generation, and without their help, I don't think the beer lab would be where it is today. Um, we worked with the Center for Career Planning to set up some industry interactions. I, I really wanted them not just to be doing uh, lab at the bench, but also to see what an industry was. Um, and so I was working with uh, Sarah Hobgood at the Center for Career Planning. Thank you, Sarah. And um, we developed these these interactions where the students actually had to go to the breweries. They had to collect samples. Um, they had to provide data to the, the brewmasters um, and just an opportunity that a lot of students or that maybe perhaps a traditional student um, or a traditional student experience, I should say, uh, maybe doesn't have. Now, Emily was the first uh, brew turn. Um, I think the kids these days would call her the OG. Um, Emily actually was taking um, the instrumental class just for fun. Um, she didn't need it for her major. Um, so I asked her for her help. Um, she had great hands in the lab. Um, attention to detail, you can see um, some of the results of her work here. Uh, these are methods. Um, the sequential titration, we're talking about acid digestion of beer for, for use in metal analysis in the ICP. Um, we've got a picture of the diacetyl calibration curve, which um, is, takes, takes a lot of attention to detail to get that level. Um, so Emily did a great job. So Emily started reaching out to the brewers um, and then building on Emily's success. Um, Sam and Ashley stepped in and they, they started reaching out even more, um, following up, providing data, uh, the methods that Emily had, had now put in place and developed. Uh, we continued on. Uh, we started uh, getting a little more detailed and developed with our methods. And um, actually, we were invited to the dark night of winter um, beer festival at St. George's Brewing um, just before COVID, so February of 2020. Um, and Sam and Ashley actually ran almost 40 um, samples of, of dark beers, so uh, using the centrifuge, filtration, dilution, um, all to make these the ASBC color measurements all within a few hours. And then the picture uh, below the, the invitational next to the tag of the best beer festival uh, was a presentation. The, the darkest beer was actually presented to Twisted Knot Brewing, which is in Newport News, um, so another local brewery. Um, and it was just, it was a lot of fun. It was great. We were interacting with the community. We were out there. We were showing what we could do. Um, and then a scientific aspect to uh, the award of the darkest beer. So obviously, Emily, um, Sam, and Ashley were doing great jobs, um, but we were growing fast, and we needed to grow the group in order to get um, these projects that we were trying to do. Um, and I think we were able to do that because of this two-course model um, that our faculty members, Dr. Carney and Dr. Klein, came up with. Um, it's published in JCAM Ed, uh, but we have a course that they take in their junior year and then another course that our chem majors take in their senior year. So the junior course um, is Chem 391, and they have to choose a current research topic. And so Dr. Cole and Dr. Carney um, currently run that, that course, um, and our students really get involved in um, learning how to read scientific li literature, learning how to decipher and digest that material. Um, and the students love taking the course with Dr. Carney and Dr. Cole. Um, and then 492 is our senior level um, capstone co course taught by Dr. Patterson. And really the focus there is an inquiry-based experiment. So the student has to write a proposal, the student has to run their experiment, and then the student has to defend their results. And this setup, uh, really with the help of Dr. Cole and Dr. Carney identifying students that um, might be interested in the, in the beer project, and then Dr. Patterson's support in his course um, for helping us um, run the experiments and really allowing the students themselves to decide um, what the twist is and where they're going with this project really helped um, helped us branch out and helped us identify things that we needed um, in the beer project. 
So as part of the 492 course, Dr. Patterson started incorporating student presentations that were part of the course with our um, Paideia uh, conference. And so the students have a lot of fun with this. It's a great experience. Um, they dress up. Um, we get to invite members from the community. Um, in, in 2019, I actually invited um, some brewers. We had some head brewers uh, show up. Um, some other reps that are part of the, the beer project came. Um, you can see these pictures of the group. Uh, randomly, uh, we all wore our Navy suits and, uh, and camel colored uh, shoes that day. Um, the students stand up at the, the podium. They can invite their friends, their significant others. Um, they have a lot of fun with it, even though they are being graded um, specifically for Dr. Patterson's group. But this Paideia Conference really highlights our student research. Um, and if you're not careful in the upper right or the center of the slide there, you see a, a picture of your professor um, randomly walking up to the president of the university, President Tribble, and inviting him to come see the beer talks. Um, now, this picture was taken by a student that did not want me to do this. Um, however, they failed. Um, I did invite President Tribble. Unfortunately, uh, he was, he was uh, preoccupied or had a previous engagement. So the combination of those courses um, and the work that the students have to do uh, with those projects, I think really led to the ability for the beer research team to actually start addressing um, all of these different areas and, and the complexity of the areas that we highlighted. So now I'll get into um, some more specifics. So Lena is a current group member. Um, and she's really um, focusing in on, on our hop analysis. And we found that the, a lot of the, the recent literature is suggesting that actually the ratio of the alpha and beta acids um, and the ratio of the alpha acids to the isomerized isoalpha acids um, might actually be the most important aspect um, of the acids. And as we mentioned before, this is the function of the wort boiling time and the temperature. Um, so the starting ratio and the starting material is critical. We're also seeing that um, the comparison of the literature and the fast literature um, with different col uh, columns and different solvent efficiencies um, comes into play. And so Selena is using um, HPLC uh, to look at the acid profiles and she's focusing in on the cultivar. Um, also there are the things like pellet versus cone um, and that really is a brewer dependent, uh, depending on what the brewer um, wants to use, what they're more comfortable with, uh, what's available. Um, we're getting different, uh, different ratios, different compounds. And so then also um, she's able to do finished products and we're looking at shelf life and what that's doing. Again, as far as the, the beta acids, when we talked about long-term bittering agent, uh, what that actually means. So while Selena is focusing in on the hard and soft resins in the LC, um, there's also um, the essential oils, which are volatile. Um, and so depending on when the hops are added into the boil, um, they may or may not be present. And so these compounds, these essential oils, are what we're looking for uh, for our aroma and also possibly some flavoring agents, um, depending on when the hops are added. And so we're using uh, Noah is actually a graduate student that for his independent uh, study is doing solid phase microextraction um, in our GC, uh, which is the GCMS. Um, and we're using extraction again from pellets and cones um, and also from our beer products. So the addition of the mass spec um, with the GC allows us some metabolite mechanism type studies um, that we're looking into. And this is going to also change uh, based on the lifetime of the boil. And then as we find out more, obviously, uh, the brewers can then decide when they actually want to add the hops or a specific hop um, to the process. I brought up the complexity of these reactions um, multiple times. And as we're working with the industry and the, and the brewers, uh, we still need to provide some baseline and, and some reference uh, for them. And so uh, Nicholas, um, shown at the UVViz, and, and Matt, who just started with the group, um, are running these, these measurements, these ASBC methods, the color, the bitterness unit, the pH, uh, 
the TA, the titratable acidity, uh, diacetyl measurements. We're we're doing all of this um, for every uh, beer that we get, or for every um, beer that a specific hop was used in for the other analysis. We, we're making baseline measurements, and these are hard numbers that the brewers can use. Um, and it's also a baseline um, for our different styles. And so as we build the portfolio, as we're looking at lagers versus pale ales versus um, India pale ales, um, we now have um, a range of these numbers um, that we can associate and compare. Now, Jessica is one of our senior um, Pogia students this semester, and she's actually running uh, quantitative measures on calcium, magnesium, um, iron, copper, and manganese for the brewers. These are hard numbers that are being provided, um, indicative of yeast health, uh, mouthfeel, and if perhaps you're a brewer that's maybe interested in some period ales and want to match the water profile of 18th century Scotland, um, we can help you with that. Um, in addition to those measurements, uh, Jessica is actually looking at the qualitative um, information of these, the mineral profile of these metals that are in the water based on a different location in, in Hampton Roads. And so what else is in there? Um, yes, there are some quantitative measures, but are, are there other um, materials or metals in there specifically? And does that change with location? Does it change with time? Does it change based on the, the recent weather? What are the filtration methods that the companies are using, the, the brewers are using, um, or the treatment facility, if we're getting water from a different treat treatment facility, does that municipal water supply, does it differ as far as its um, metal profile? Felipe is another one of our senior Pogia students, and he's looking at foam stability. Um, and by location, we mean um, from the keg or from the, the tap in the tap room or a bottle or a can. Um, we mentioned a little bit before that the foam stability is, is a pretty complicated uh, combination of the alpha and beta acids and the oxidized um, compounds that come from the hard resins. Um, and a, a lot of this is it's not super well understood. So um, we're using an ASBC method, but Felipe is also de developing um, another method to identify whether or not uh, you know, our surfactants, our, our soaps and our dishwashing um, might play a role in that, in, in changing um, our foam stability. And so in the, the picture of the UV Viz here, Felipe doesn't look as happy as he does with the giant funnel of beer on the right. Um, and I just wanted to point out that this class, the structure of the class and this project, and really CNU, we, we do want to provide them with the experience of, you know, it's not always going to work. And when Felipe, he, he came in, he did a great job, and he developed and he, he ran – um, he did a lot of work, and then it didn't work the way that it was supposed to work. And But he, he followed that up again with a good job, and he went and he found out that, well, then maybe it's a different type of surfactant. So ionic versus non-ionic surfactants, and it's a great job, and he's actually added a little bit more work for himself. Um, but you know, now we have something that we didn't know we needed to consider that we are considering. So Nick is our last Pogia student this semester, and he's looking at the sulfur content as a function of malt. Um, we were seeing some unexpected results using the same malt, uh, but getting some different flavors than what we were expecting um, with, with the different lagers. And so there's some concern about whether it's the shelf life of the material or perhaps the warp conditions. Um, sulfur can cause some off-putting flavors if, if you're not careful. So Nick is uh, developing a headspace GCMS method, um, really focusing in on the analytical aspect of this. Um, and we're going to be using, uh, again, the sulfur content. Um, you can start to see that now we're expanding from just the hop analysis into our malt analysis and understanding of these reactions as well. So there's a lot to consider. Um, it's not just uh, we throw something together and, and then this is produced. These, the starting materials are key. Um, all of these um, processes, the, the hard versus the soft resins, the, the enzymes, the sugars, um, the mineral content, it, it all leads towards um, a good product. And we're, we are also expanding the identification of these materials. And hopefully, 
um, as we identify some of these natural materials, um, some different fields of science that, that we can interact with. And as we start to look at the fate of these molecules, so what happens to the starting materials as they go through the brewing process, um, you can see that the, the students are really key to this development of, of this project and to our research. Um, and, and Nick is starting to, to work over here in the malt and um, with our sulfur content. And what's going to happen as we, we're identifying our starting materials now, um, but as we start working with finished products with the brews, um, really the identification of these reactions and the, of these processes that are going on. So there's a lot, there's a lot left to do, um, but it's exciting. We have some, some places to expand uh, that we're looking for, um, but the students are doing a great job and, you know, they are integral to the success that we're experiencing um, as part of the beer project and the, and the research team. So I really, I wanted to take a chance to highlight them and to thank them because without their efforts, the, the research is not possible. We're obviously not finished with our work um, with the alpha and beta acids and the hot profiles, the, the hard versus soft resins, um, the essential oils. There's a lot of work left to do there. But as these students um, start com completing some projects and, and building projects and identifying projects, we're also able to expand the group um, and, and look at some different things. And as we bring in the studies um, you know, that Nick and Felipe are doing with the malts and the, the oxidation products, then we can start really looking at the overall processes and our mayored reactions, for example, um, that are really going to enable us to paint um, a big picture of what's going on and then the metabolites and what happens throughout the process of brewing and, and hopefully building that into um, other fields of science. And we actually, um, I wanted to provide a, a picture here. This is a GC uh, 2014 that we, we just had installed in the, in the teaching laboratory, but this is going to allow um, some more numbers for the brewers, some alcohol t content. Um, we are trying to, to get um, a mass spec so that we can do some more metabolite studies to actually determine what happens to those molecules um, throughout the brewing process and then the aging process as well. Um, because that's going to depend on, again, um, where we can go with this and, and our understanding of the processes. So before I run out of time, I want to introduce you to the current team. Uh, we have Dr. Dimitri Liskin, who is um, a home brewer and uh, an organic chemist. And there was a recent seminar by the ACS uh, talking about why chemists make the best home brewers. And to uh, follow it up, uh, also, Dr. Andrew Higgs, um, again, a home brewer and organic chemist. Um, I think you can see where we're going. Um, they bring their expertise um, not only with chemistry but also with home brewing um, into this because there is an aspect of you actually have to, to get your hands dirty in order to, to study these materials and, and these compounds, and they've been great. They've been a great addition to the team, and I, I really appreciate their help, um, and I, I think um, – Students love both of these guys as well, so um, we're, we're growing. Uh, Selena and um, Matt are both uh, juniors this year, and so they'll be around for another year, and we expect great things out of them. So Nick uh, Rogers is Kim Major, also a home brewer. Um, he'll be graduating this year. Um, he's looking for jobs, so he's interested in the field, um, and I have uh, a lot of confidence that he'll um, land somewhere very quickly. Uh, Nicholas is a biochemistry major. Um, he's actually going to be he's going to be graduating this year actually uh, as well, and is starting to prepare for the GRE. So we'll have to um, these are, these are the the members that are actually leaving us stranded by the way. So I, I failed to mention that um, Felipe, a biochemistry major, uh, graduating this year as well. Um, Jessica, a chemistry major, also graduating. She'll be going on to uh, to graduate school at William and Mary. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention that Felipe um, is looking at grad school, professional schools um, as well. So, again, great things out of these guys coming coming your way. Um, Noah is finishing up his master's, uh, but he is also a home brewer. Um, and so 
he's uh, got a job lined up, um, and he's going to be finishing his degree. As a PI for a beer project, I am excited about the research and where we're going with this and the data that we're getting. Um, but I'm also really proud of our former students and what the beer project has um, hopefully helped them with and, and their success, because if they succeed, then that makes, um, that makes us look better um, as a group. And so I did want to highlight our former students as well. So Emily is currently a chemist at Abbott Laboratories. She's working on toxicology screening. And so this is um, her poster from the Paideia conference. And so she actually compared the ASBC method of the sequential titration and uh, develop um, a comparison using the ICP OES uh, data as well. Dyler was one of the first uh, Pogia students to work on the beer project. Uh, her work was specific to looking at uh, degassing methods in beer and how that affected color measurements um, and the measurements that we were making in the UV viz. Uh, the picture of Skylar here, uh, you, you may have heard of a show called Game of Thrones. Um, and so they, they actually, uh, Skylar was the assistant brewer at Tradition Brewing um, in Newport News and just recently accepted uh, the role, a job is the role of scientist um, with PPD in Richmond. She's working in the vac uh, vaccine sciences. Daniel was also part of that um, first class of POGI students to work on the beer project. Um, his work was with the ICP OES. Um, he was looking at the water quality, um, specifically calcium and magnesium in the water, the different uh, municipal supplies, uh, which has now been expanded um, to include Jessica's uh, work and uh, Daniel is now a quality chemist at Impact Fine Chemicals, um, just south of Richmond, Virginia. So Chuck is the final member of that 2019 class um, to work on the beer project. He's currently a naval systems engineer for the Department of the Navy. Um, Chuck's work was focused on diacetyl content and, um, as it turns out, color content as a function of aging. And so Chuck actually developed um, a synthetic aging mechanism, which uh, we are putting to use. Um, even now. Sam actually started uh, the HOP project and the, the alpha and beta acid profiling. Um, unfortunately, her POGI experience was cut short due to the pandemic, um, but she did have a lot of beer work. And again, we finished up um, the best beer festival of, of 2020 um, running those color measurements. And so Sam is actually starting at VCU's School of Pharmacy. Um, in the fall. Ashley's POGIA experience was also quite, uh, cut short due to the pandemic, uh, but Ashley was actually looking at the mycotoxins in the hops, moss of the cereals um, in different storage facilities. Um, so that's, a, that's an area that we're still growing into, um, but she's currently working at Quest Diagnostics in their forensic toxicology department. So we actually had an, an opportunity to see uh, the industry in action and tradition brewing invited us um, to help um, can to help um, brew a, a beer and you can see Noah here adding the hops um, it was a great experience um, it was great and Noah's work was actually highlighted in the campus happenings um, here on campus I also wanted to thank uh, the local breweries that we work with uh, these breweries are all in the Hampton Roads area Williamsburg Newport News uh, Hampton, um, Oozle Finch, um, Ale Works, uh, Precarious Beer Project, Tradition Brewing, St. George uh, Brewing Company, and the Virginia Beer Company, um, not only for working with uh, with our research team, but also with the teaching laboratories um, and, you know, interacting with the students, with the brew terms, um, and just interacting with us in general as far as and it, the advice that they give us as far as what's important and what's not important and, and uh, you know, things that we can work on and, and things that we can, can look at um, in the future. So thank you to all of them as well. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you um, to everyone out there listening. Thank you, Trey, for the opportunity to present um, our work and, and share with you our story. Um, I'd also like to thank some, um, some other people from the Shimazu team, uh, Tom McCall, Paul Masick, Andrew Perego, Marion Welsh, and Faith Hayes. Um, you know, we really don't want our students to just see a box that they throw something into and 
we really want them to understand it. And so perhaps I get a little overzealous at, at times, and we know that if you let a professor into the lab, um, things can get messy and things can go wrong. So whether it's a technical question or um, just leaning on your expertise or just talking about the project in general, um, those folks have always been a great help. Um, and without them, I don't think uh, we'd be up and running and stay up and running the way that we have. So thank you um, to everyone on that team. And uh, again, thanks for listening and cheers. Let's thank Dr. Quinlan for such an exciting presentation. Again, under the resource list, you can find more information about our analytical solutions. If you have not had a chance, please fill out the survey questions on the right-hand side to provide feedback and request additional information. We also encourage you and your colleagues to attend our upcoming webinars, which encompass a wide variety of application areas. The registration link is located at the bottom of this slide. This time we'll begin our Q&A session. Thank you for the audience for attending and sending questions. We have time for a few questions. Dr. Quinlan, uh, question one, are you offering sensory training to your students? It might be very interesting to correlate perceived bitterness with acid ratio. So in the teaching lab, um, I agree that would be very interesting, but in the teaching lab, not all of our students are 21. So there are some opportunities with the specific brewers themselves uh, that they've allowed us to, to tour their facilities to, to come actually. Um, you saw Noah's work with the, the brewery there at uh, Tradition. Um, and so if the student is of age, then, um, then they're allowed to do that. Uh, but that's something that's off campus that's associated with just the brewery. Gotcha. All right, question number two. Um, have you had any research into how the hop concentration or addition at different intervals, such as dry hopping, has affected the fermentation process or breakdown of specific compounds? I'd like to know if any research has been done on using profiles of hop oils as a way to identify and verify the geographic origin of different hop cultivars. So we have not done that yet. Um, I, I shouldn't say we haven't done that. We are in the process of doing that and, tr and trying to do that. There's a, um, a big surge right now um, as far as dry hopping and uh, hopping within the, the fermentation. And from the oils, uh, after, you know, if you put the hops in after the boil is completed, after fermentation is completed, then you really get that aroma um, and those essential oils, the volatiles stay in there. Uh, but there's actually some current research that's going on now where the yeast actually process and digest uh, some of the hops as well. So there's a trade-off, and a, a lot of brewer, brewers are seeing that trade-off, um, but they get a, you know, that's a lot for the hazy IPAs, that, that style. Um, so it just adds, you know, the fact that the yeast is now, you know, acting on the hops, which they wouldn't, uh, not normally thought of, it just adds to the complexity and the, you know, the interest level of what's going on goes up. And so, um, you know, we're probably going to be looking for some, some instruments and, and some different techniques to get in there and, and figure that out, yeah. And as far as the, the cultivars in different regions, one of our main goals is to provide these brewers with the cookbook so that, you know, if they get, um, you know, let's say a cascade from from Oregon versus, a, or from Washington State versus a, a cascade grown, you know, in our backyard, um, what does that do to the acid ratio? So not necessarily um, a forensic science identify the origin type thing, um, I guess we could do that. Um, that would be interesting. Uh, but more along the lines so the brewers can get that exact flavor profile that they want. I mean, they really are artists. And so we've been uh, working with them, and I've learned more about the process than I even thought possible. Um, but, but yeah, and a lot of the stuff that they do is sensory. Um, and so they hopefully we're, we're giving them useful numbers to, to go with that sensory experience. Got it. All right, how long, months, semesters, is the typical time period that a student can devote to a project? Does this time frame factor into your experimental design? So, yes, that's a good question. So as a, a PUI, we, our students really, they can take research for credit, um, and they can go up to three credit hours, but that's approximately 12 hours in, in the lab. 
Um, for most of their schedules, our students are, are really active and they take pretty heavy loads. So most students that are doing um, research are looking maybe for four hours a week. Uh, so we do have a lot of students um, working together. I, I try to get them to work together. Um, that's a skill that, um, that I'm hoping uh, that we, we all learn. And so working together like that. Uh, but we also have a summer scholars program. And what that happen, or what happens is that the students write their own proposal. Um, and then it's, it goes in front of a panel. And uh, that helps them get their uh, stipend for their summer and a, and a housing allotment. And so then they can stay on campus during the summer. And we get a lot of research done over the summer that way. Nice, nice. OK. Um, what do you think is the most versatile tool for a craft brewer to get for beer quality? Oh, uh, definitely the UV Viz, I, I think. So we, we run a lot of measurements, the di dicetyl color, IBU, um, you, you really, and there's, there's more out there with, with the, the UV Viz. So that's, uh, if, if you were going to pick one, um, I would say that would be my, my first, uh, first choice. Gotcha. Um, do local brewers pay you to run samples for them? And if so, how do you set up those relationships? So no, we actually don't get paid. Um, the The goal is community engagement and and job opportunities. So um, to start that relationship, I would suggest uh, go and have a pint and tell the brewer, hey, I like this. You did a great job. Um, maybe I can help you. And um, eventually what I would like to happen is, yeah, I would like for the, the brewers, the community to kind of chip in and provide some a pot of money for a summer internship, a paid internship opportunity. Um, but like I, you know, the previous question about our students, they stay really busy during the school year. And so, you know, getting them those opportunities, we, we are time limited uh, with that. But uh, that's what we're hoping to get to. Um, right now, especially in the pandemic, um, you know, we're going to, we have a budget for, for our labs anyway. Um, and I write grants to the ASBC, to the Brewers Network, uh, Brewers Association, excuse me, um, to, to help fund the research. Great. And last question uh, near and dear to my heart. With the rise of gluten allergies and celiac disease, have you or other brewers looked uh, more into gluten-free alternatives? So, yes. I mean, um, one of the amazing things that I, about these, these local brewers is they're continually offering and, and looking to expand on what they can offer within the regulations and, and things like that. Um, so whether it's a seltzer or gluten-free or, you know, a, a pomegranate goza or, or something like that, they, um, they're they always looking into it. And that makes, you know, makes what we do, we have to stay on our toes because those are different matrices and those are different um, interactions that, that we have to consider as we adjust those methods. Um, but it, you know, it's really exciting. The students really get into it, and um, and yeah, so it, we're we're getting there. Um, I know there are a few gluten free options out there that um, some people think are pretty good. Some people would say no. Um, so obviously, we're you know we're gonna try to keep working on that and uh, make everybody happy. Eventually, that's the goal. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Quinlan. Um, thank you all for the interesting questions. Since we don't have time to answer remaining questions, uh, we'll read out individually to each, uh, each of those questions that we're not able to answer today. We'll reach out to you and answer them. Once again, thank you all for attending and participating. We'll send you an email with a link to view a recorded version of this presentation anytime you choose. Again, we encourage you and your colleagues to attend our upcoming webinars, and the registration link is located at the bottom of this slide. Again, thank you, Dr. Quinlan, and everybody for uh, attending, and we look forward to uh, having another one in the future. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Trey.